Accessing library computer data. And to make sure history never forgets the name Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske Podcast. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a podcast where we are running through all 178 episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, giving our thoughts and feelings about each and every one. And right now we're up to episode 18 of season 6. It's called Starship Mine. Directed by Cliff Bowl, written by Morgan Gendel of Inner Light fame. And it aired back on March 29th, 1993. In this episode, while the Starship Enterprise is evacuated for maintenance, Captain Picard must alone contend with mercenaries posing as a work crew aboard the ship. Christian is here to talk about this one. Starship Mine, they call it Die Hard in Space. Is that true? Is that accurate? Is that what it really, really means? <laughs> We're going to discuss that and much more right after this. Captain? Bridge? It has been quite a day, has it not? Yes, it has. However, a change of routine is often invigorating and can be a welcome diversion after a long assignment. Exactly. I understand that Arcaria has some very interesting weather patterns. Mr. Data, are you all right? Yes, sir. I am attempting to fill a silent moment with non-relevant conversation. Small talk. Yes, sir. I have found that humans often use small talk during awkward moments. Therefore, I have written a new subroutine for that purpose. How did I do? Welcome to Mott the Barber Runs Around on the Enterprise, the episode. Christian, how are you? I'm good, sir. How about yourself? Good, good. Um... We're going to talk about Starship Mine, I guess now, which is the Die Hard in Space. Uh, that's how it was pitched. That's how it's been received. That's how it's criticized. <laughs> um, so how? Let's see here. What, do Do you have any like opinions about Die Hard <laughs> before we get into? Uh, uh, it's my favorite Christmas movie. It's one of my favorite action movies in general. Uh, I don't know about enough about film history to say whether or not how iconic it was or if it spawned a genre, but I mean, it's, it's just a genius bit of storytelling and the, there's nothing like it's not Schindler's list, but it's like the action equivalent of it. I think. Sure. It, it, it's with the stuff that you do, the, the stuff that, uh, McTiernan, right? The, the cop, no, um, the the director for Die Hard. McTiernan, oh yeah, right? McTiernan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The stuff that he's able to do with a fairly straightforward premise and a very fairly straightforward main character, I I, th- I think is is great. Everything that action should be. Yep. Yeah, it's um my opinion of Die Hard is it's probably one of the best action movies ever made. Um, and it largely Agreed. comes down to the script for Die Hard is like virtually airtight. Um. And, yeah. so, and so as a segue into that, where the Die Hard script is basically everything happens for a reason and it pays off in some way. Um, and there's also very, there's very little extra fluff to it. It's very focused, very lean, a very good idea, and it doesn't run into a lot of problems internally. Mm-hmm. Um, to segue into Starship Mine, I think Starship Mine is like, it's not a poor man's version of Die Hard. It's more like a destitute <laughs> version of Die Hard. It's it doesn't really do anything outside of it copies the idea, but it doesn't get anywhere near to the precision that you need to pull off this kind of idea. No, it is it's definitely not airtight. There are several key things that I'm just watching. I'm like, well, why why didn't he just do that? Um, I was reading a, on trivia, and the guy, I guess the writer, he says. He said that he denied the connection to Die Hard, and he commented, I'm not going to talk about it as Die Hard. That's someone else's work. It's an idea that we've seen countless times, Under Siege, Passenger 57, etc. Yep. And like, while I'll admit that the idea of a lone person on a ship or building or whatever 
fighting against a superior number of opponents. I would not say that's something that Die Hard pioneered, but it's absolutely the most well-known, most well-received. I mean, if you're going to pitch this, you're not going to pitch it as Under Siege in space. It's going to be Die Hard yeah. in space, because Die Hard is better. Right. I, I guess. And, that... then he, and then the pitch to the episode was titled Die Hard on the Enterprise. Yeah, Die Hard so. on the Enterprise. I mean, it's more... <laughs> I, I guess a more apropos thing would be Air Force One in space. Um, it's That's a, another good one. Just because you're, you're flying around, I think. It, it yeah. ties in there. But yeah, I think that the... Um, I, I think this episode's fine. It, it's it's like rewatchable. Um, I don't... If you shut off your brain for this one, I think it works okay. Um, you know, the show never does action very well. So it's not surprising that a action-focused episode is not like a barn burner. Uh, yeah, this is probably one of the better action episodes, though. Yeah, it is. I think. I so. mean, it's in the realm of poor TNG acting, and in the litany of Worf getting his ass kicked, this is pretty. I mean, this is this is pretty good for them. Yes, in terms of yeah, because I mean, I it doesn't feel true. like really. A lot of times, it feels really awkward, and you'd think they would be better at it because I think that a lot of the action in the original series although it's ridiculous now it's still fun it's engaging but a lot of the action in tng just comes across as well tos like was awkward there's too much pa- there's too much pauses well tos was like stylized like and it's fight mm-hmm. scenes like it was it was like comical but it was like sort of a stylized like over the top throwing haymakers and like double yeah. axe handle smashes and stuff <laughs> Uh, TNG the double is fisted going, hammer blow. Do, TNG is going for a more realistic thing, but they don't have the budget to shoot the action well enough. Like to shoot action like that, you need to do a lot of takes and a lot of different cuts and things like do that. You th- how much of that do you think is budget, and how much of that do you think is personnel? No, it's totally budget. Um, really? I, yeah, like they would make? What does budget allow? And this is maybe I'm speaking out of my own ignorance, but what does budget get you? For an action scene, budget gets you time because you need to shoot. I was just time. You need much. you need fi- you need to shoot ten times the amount of footage that you'd normally shoot for a regular uh, A B scene where two people are talking to each other. Because you need to mm-hmm. you need to film every single angle, uh, you know, multiple times. So that makes sense. The budget is going to be impacted because you only have the time to shoot a couple takes, a couple scenes, and then you have to move on. And you have to edit it that way. So a lot of T and G scenes are someone dives on someone and they roll on the ground for like seven seconds of one take and that's all they do and it's like all right well that's not very exciting it doesn't look good and that's just kind of the problem with it um it's also this episode just outside of that i think i think the actor who plays the the stunt double for captain picard basically is in half the episode of this one and it's really noticeable on the blu-ray discs uh every single time it's, yeah it's some guy with a bald cap that they like spray painted his head silver it's very very obvious now i was watching it fast i didn't i suppose i wasn't paying enough attention i think it's helped by the fact that a lot of it's in low lighting mm-hmm I mean, they do they do a good job with the, uh, the changing up the lighting in this one. It's it's interesting how they they've shot it differently. And yeah, apparently they, they had a lot of problems with it because one of their big time saving things that they started, I guess, in season three, is that they got their lighting scheme down and they basically didn't diverge from that at all. Yep. And so by this point, they it was a very kind of finely well honed machine. And then turning off the lights, well, well, then they had to work, uh, kind of improvise their way through it, and apparently it was more difficult, which I... Yeah, I mean, it would be the same as... I'm not a student of film, but that kind of stuff sounds really interesting to me. No, I mean, mean, their lighting in general is so that they they light so brightly, everything's overlit, so that they can shoot from multiple angles. Mm -hmm. Um, And you take a more film approach where you have to actually light the scene. It's going to take much longer. Uh, Another budget issue that you're going to run into. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess we can talk about the way to lead into this is uh, the setup for this episode takes a very, very long time to get going. I think think it takes 15 minutes, judging by what I was looking at when I I froze the screen to see like when this is going in. At least... Yeah, at least 15 minutes and takes, I think, a little bit longer to really get going from there. I like the idea... 
as far as the setup, I like the idea of regular maintenance maintenance. Yep. Because they do talk about like I think a lot of people have this idea of Star Trek where it's there's infinite power and not, and everything can run forever. But they state many times that no, there are power limitations. And when people say, like, well, why isn't every room a, a holodeck that you can customize however you want? Well, no, the holodeck and replicators take a ton of power. Mm-hmm. So you can't just replicate anything indefinitely. So I like I, I like putting limitations on it because then, then I can take it more seriously. Like, oh, yeah, they their engines can't run forever. Oh, yeah, they do need regular maintenance. So I like that. Of course, the problem is because it was invented with this episode, it's never, ever, ever been mentioned before or since. No. So uh, that I'm like, oh, well, okay. Well, they mentioned that the Enterprise has been it's done every five years. Yeah, it's in the well, the Enterprise has so logged more time or something like that. So I guess if you end a series after seven years, you only need to see it once, yeah. uh, no matter what happens in it. Um, well, I guess unless you get it done in first season as the pilot, but outside of that, yeah. um, I don't know. The I think the Baryon sweep works okay i i I mean i think that the the setup here is funny because the teaser is weird that the the teaser a plays like it's a series finale with picard walking around on the bridge by himself which i thought was odd and it also does not set up the problem which is weird for the teaser of this show uh because they just they're leaving the ship and you don't know what the you don't know that this group that's coming on to do the sweep is corrupt or crooked at this point i don't know to, to me the teaser felt weird because you see those people come on, and Picard looks at them weird. Yep. And I, I, either they're they're totally there for a good reason, in which case you, just, you should just shrug and move on, or it should have some kind of sinister thing that maybe Picard doesn't even notice, but the audience notices. Yes. Um, I think the reason actually for why Picard is doing that weird kind of look around the empty bridge is another thing that the writer said, and that he... The strong, the element that he liked in the script was, he said, uh, what I liked was the element I had come up with uh, of the captain going down with the ship, which was rejected as a notion in the 24th century. This is a strong line for me, a captain alone with a ship. My theory is that what Picard loved most was the Enterprise. And I think that's the kind of the idea that he was playing with most, so that he's trying to put in this idea of, oh, Picard doesn't like leaving his baby, basically. Right. I don't know if that comes through, and I didn't really pick up on that until I read this behind-the-scenes thing, but I think that explains why he's having that weird look. And I think that's why he gives the people a weird look, because he doesn't want, you know, strangers touching his... Right. I, I think there's it's supposed to be implied that, toy. like, they, they don't really play it up. Like, they're not particularly abusive to no. the ship or anything, so I don't, I don't know. No, they do it just to sort of set the page or set the stage for the fact that something's going to happen here so the character knows for no particular reason that uh these guys are up to no good it's similar when he when he runs into the vulcan tuvok um he he well no this is just a this is just a regular human uh he's a vulcan isn't he uh tuvok is a tim russ plays the vulcan tuvok in voyager this guy is just a random human nobody because otherwise he'd be able to kick picard's ass Vulcans are really strong. I get, I yeah, I guess uh, that's funny. Yeah, he doesn't. I, he doesn't have the pointed ears. Oh, okay. Uh, he runs into uh, Tim Russ, and he immediately yeah. gets suspicious for apparently no reason. I, I don't really understand why that happens. I don't understand why Tim Russ uh, continues to go after him. I don't see what the point yeah. of that was. Um, it's obviously just to kickstart the the mm-hmm. action sequence of it. But before that, we get to deal with. Um, the data subplots and sort of the the, sub, <laughs> the subplot that I love, I love the data subplot removes the rest of the cast and adds them. You know they have to be they, the rest of the cast has to be removed somehow so that you can yes. deal with Picard on the Enterprise. So what they do is they beam them down to a party that no one wants to go to, and it's hosted by this guy named Hutch who uh, is a master of small talk, and Data is learning small talk is his storyline, and so they they go at each other. Um, yeah, I. I think the thing that struck me most about this episode is how little of it is actually Picard on the ship doing the diehard stuff. Mm -hmm. And a good, you know, 30, 40% of it focuses on the crew on the ground and the plot that happens before the diehard stuff even starts, which is, which is weird, a little disappointing, but also as the diehard stuff was happening, 
I got bored with it about like three quarters of the way full, so I can imagine why they couldn't do an episode that entire way, even though I feel that they should. Well, they be able could. To. They just had to put in a little more work on it. You'd... I mean, it's just not. I guess I'll come down. You can let me know how you feel. The, the biggest problem with this episode, I think, is the staging of the show doesn't allow for this kind of a plot. Uh, it happened in both storylines where the, the, the down on the planet with Riker and all them. They're in a big room with armed guards, and they're mm. apparently whispering to each other, but the <laughs> guards don't hear anything. So you have this weird stage problem of they're all in the same room. They're, the guards are literally looking at them, talking to each other, <laughs> like suspiciously they're walking probably around. probably up to nothing. And they don't do anything about it. And it has the problem of the Enterprise, the geography of the Enterprise doesn't make a lot of sense because... I don't understand why Picard has such a successful time cutting off people from moving to different parts of the ship. He cuts the ladder out of one thing. And apparently this is like a huge problem for the hijackers, which makes no goddamn sense to me. It's like, why is that one ladder so important to their plans? They just go around it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the setup, I I think that there is, you're right, the the, real... on the surface, it doesn't make any sense why the guards are just wandering around, letting letting them both wander and chat with each other. I mean, that's kind of the stereotypical, you know, guard goes over and says, shut up, move over there, you separate. Yep, but they yep. don't do any of that, they just stand around. I like the setup in terms of the Baryon sweep, because it gives a reasonable explanation for why they have to constantly keep moving and why there's a constant time rush. Yep. Because if there wasn't, if it was just some general non-lethal thing, well, then they could just wander around. There would there would be no kind of external impetus to keep them moving or to keep any kind of action going on. They could just kind of wait at, wait each other out. Yep. Um, I think that I'm, I'm willing to accept Picard being able to move around the ship better than them because, I mean, he knows it. And I'm sure they've been studying for it for a while, but I'm sure that well, apparently he they have knows. not because they don't know who he is, which is bizarre. Like there's no there's no well, implication yeah. that they've been reviewing anything because they've obviously should have been planning for this. But they a don't I, know the most famous captain in Starfleet, and they don't I think know they got mired in the technical. <laughs> that's, that's well, right. <laughs> I think they know who he is. I they, don't think they know what he looks like. Yeah, which is I, like I they find said, that the captain is John Luke Picard. Oh, yeah. But they don't know what John Luke Picard looks like. Yep. Uh, as far as the latter, I, I don't. Kelsey seemed to think. The impression I got from Kelsey is that she was annoyed, but didn't totally screw them up. It's also possible that they, at that point, they were somewhere in the neck of the ship, where there are fewer options. Of course, those options are then also not as far away. I mean, yeah. I just, I, I can't imagine that there's only one access, like, or even two. Like, I can't imagine that there's so limited access to move around this thing. Uh, I think it's mainly a, a time delay. He knows that they'll be able to get around. He can't cut all the ladders. Yeah. But and also, I, I think with a little bit of effort, you could probably climb up. Uh, but I think it's mainly <laughs> a, a time sink. They are all trying to rush, and the more that they fall behind, the more that Picard can get ahead of them and. Yes, I just, do I don't feel that things. the ship, the, like, the, it just doesn't, it, like, it works in the building, because you're basically, in the Die Hard building, you know, they're kind of holed up, because they're te- mm-hmm. holding hostages, and the police are surrounding them, so they're kind of limited in what they can do. Yeah. The ship doesn't have that limitation, because no one is there around you. Um, so, the the moving through needs to happen for the script to make sense. The Baryon Sweep needs to push everybody around to do all that stuff, but... It doesn't feel to me that what Picard does is enough of a hindrance for the script to even focus on it. When instead, they it's another thing they ignored from Die Hard. The villain in this episode is terrible. She's like, she's just horrifically written. There's nothing to her. Um, and, you know, Alan Rickman is in the original Die Hard. And a lot of the screen time between them is him and Bruce Willis talking on the phone with each other. Um and it's good because Rickman's a better performer and that role was written better and there's something interesting about him. The villains here don't have anything interesting going for them. Uh, they're yeah, all it's, different it's characters, but... Mostly a kind of generic Motley crew of mostly kind of standard issue alien bad guys. Like, there's the tough guy, there's the more reserved guy, there's the 
angry female. Yep. Uh, I guess suppose the one that stands out the most is I, I don't know how Neil got involved. Yeah, Neil. Seen, <laughs> I, wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to know Neil's story. Why he's how he got the name Neil. I want to know how what crushing what they, student loan debt. What they have on him. Yeah, he's he does not seem to fit the mold, and it was it was weird that he was written that way. Um, it was. I actually didn't mind Kelsey so much. I mean, there's nothing there's nothing that spectacular about her either. Uh, but uh, kind of the, one of the weirder things. The two weird things about the terrorists is one, I don't know why she kills Neil. Yeah, I guess just is, to get a bigger cut of the pie. Yeah, like, but I, they I don't strike that. me as necessarily the the ruthless type i mean she seems to get along just fine with everyone else and neil seems like the important guy to keep around because he's the one hold, keeping the trilithium stable yeah uh, it just that seemed kind of out of left field also true. why it's they true. don't kill picard upon immediately seeing him because yeah, yeah. he ruthlessly kills a lot of them well, I, I wouldn't. I would, and they never I di- kill him. I disagree that he ruthlessly. He sort of he hinders them to a point where they get cut up, and he indirectly causes their death. Sort of well, like. Well, no. I, uh, Tim Russ's character says, "You're Starfleet. You won't kill me." As he's threatening him with a laser welder, and mm-hmm. of course he doesn't. He just uh, chokes him out, or he uh, hypersprays him. Hypersprays yeah. him. Yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, because that's Picard. He doesn't, you know, kill people. Yeah, but he still leaves him to die from the Baryon sweep. Sure, it's he didn't like drive a knife through the guy's chest, but he absolutely just left him to die. He didn't even try to save him. Same thing with the uh, Pomet, the guy he shot with the arrow, and he very intentionally set up um, the one guy who was chasing him to get killed by the Baryon sweep. You know, it's not like you know making them suffer, but Picard knows exactly what's going to happen to them, and he knows they're going to die, and he leaves them to die. And if I were the terrorists, I don't need a hostage. He's annoying. I'd just shoot him. I mean, when they think he's the barber, they're probably thinking, oh, my God, whatever. We'll just leave him for the Baryon sweep. But after that, why do they why do they keep him alive? Yeah. Just shoot him. Yeah. <laughs> Especially no, since you know he's a Starfleet officer. He just killed three of your people. I, I agree. I mean, they... they there is no... Re- I think it all just ties into... Oh, the script is not particularly strong. Like, it's... And I, I agree that they there's no reason for him to um, be left alive. Like no matter what they think yeah. he is, if, if if he's, if I'd be more inclined to think they would keep him alive if he was a captain and they can use him as a hostage, as opposed yeah. to just the lowly barber who you'd be like, or fuck, fuck you, you like die. Ransom, um, or or maybe he has, maybe there's a command lockout that he installs that only he can do, and they need him. Yeah, I thought that was going to pay off. into it because Worf brings that up at the beginning. That he needs uh, Picard I think that's to shut all it down. Just filler, and I I don't know. All, speaking of not being an airtight script, why doesn't he just turn off the shutdown sequence when he's rushing for the transporter? I don't understand why he doesn't just page the base on his communicator because he has it for the first half of the time that he's running around yeah, on the ship. Or it's that. Like, <laughs> there's no. I I understand he can't transport because the system shut well, down, but there's no reason why he can't a reactivate yeah, no, it or just no. call them on the com badge and be like, "Hey, there's some terrorists up here, um, fix it." Yeah, perhaps there there is some interference from this. I mean, the reason that the phaser doesn't work, the reason he doesn't get a phaser and just start shooting people is because of the Baryon sweep. So you can kind of techno babble your way out of something like that. You can, but yeah. at least with the phaser, they explicitly state. Your phaser won't work. Right. They they need and to. And they have communicators that, that work. Now maybe those communicators are designed to work in this environment, but they never say that. Right. They, they that kind of stuff. That's the problem with doing these premises. It's the same as the murder mystery in the future. There's too many they've created too much technology yes. that makes this difficult to get around. So they have to do throwaway lines like that. I mean it's it's it doesn't cripple the episode, but it's it's another thing that you sit there. In a great episode, you hardly notice them. In a mediocre episode, you're like, oh, there's all these problems all over the place. Um, yeah. And the communicators would tie into that quite like, as, as well as the fact that he, has lo- he hasn't locked down the ship. He could just turn it back on and say, uh, put up force fields in the engineering section and we'll get, we'll get this all sorted out. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to believe that once the ship shuts down, it's locked into shutdown mode for the sweep because I believe that turning it on would damage it and perhaps make the thing explode 
Sure. I don't know what happens the, if you turn on the engines. That I'm willing to believe, but I still don't understand why you can't stop it. Right. Yes. Because yeah, then yeah. the episode doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even then, I if the show does not tell me that, I, I'm not going to read into it that way. Like, yeah. if the show does not explicitly state that turning the ship back on would be bad during the sweep, I don't believe yeah. that it actually uh, is that way. Like, the show needs to explain these things, which is a downside of this kind of story. And not necessarily like a bunch of exposition, just. I just need Jordy in the opening to say we can't turn the ship back on for a half an hour while this while this yeah, happens. You, you don't like s- say it like directly to the audience. This is why we can't do this because of that. But say it. I, I don't know the term. Like, kind of insinuate it or say it kind of I guess sideways in the, in in a way that you can p- the audience if they're paying attention can pick up on it. Yeah. Without it just being just expo- exposition shoved down your throat. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd agree. Um, I guess we should talk about the, I mean, it's the diehard on the ship. Nothing. I mean, I don't think there's anything I wanted special. To... Talk about data. Data. <laughs> I love the scenes with data. I like it too. <laughs> I loved every scene with data. I don't care how much he was hamming it up. I, I was, I was genuinely giggling the entire time. And I'm pretty sure there's one scene where right, where, uh, uh, Jonathan Frakes is not acting the the grin at all. I'm I'm sure it took him like a dozen times to get the scene where Data first starts uh, small talking to Crusher and Riker yep. at the reception, and he, Frakes just has this huge grin on his face. And I'm sure it took him a bunch of tries. Yeah, he um he he's always the first one to break. I think in these kind yes. of things, but it's um <laughs> it's great. Yeah, Spiner comes dangerously close to being over the top. He, this is always a flaw of him when he's when he breaks the data character. I think it's just mm-hmm. because he does such a good job with the data character that like when he's given a chance to spread out, he he does it overboard a little bit too much. Yeah. Um I mean, I, it ties into the data thing of data's trying to sort of mimic these kind of this like over think, the top thing, but I think one of the problems is that honestly he I think he does it too well. I, th- I think in 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 some ways he's small. T- I know he's basically just trying to copy Hutchinson, but in some ways I feel like his small talk act is almost too good for someone who barely understands small talk and doesn't have emotions. See, I, I mean, the, the the most the, the most minor quibble. I mean, I think that he. Um, I think that he has. I just don't understand the overboardness he does with it because the Hutch character doesn't do it that way. I, I, I sort of appreciate the stuff that he's bringing up. He's bringing up like sort of nonsensical facts about planets and whatever. Mm-hmm. Like it's that kind of thing. But the, the over-the-topness kind of cloys at me and I understand they need to do it for comic relief or something. Uh, it just... They could have turned it down. I like, I like the idea. It's just Spiner always goes a little bit overboard. It's like Clay had mentioned before. It's probably because Spiner's probably the best actor on the show, but... I think the problem is he knows that he's the best actor, and it kind of leads to situations like that where he overdoes it. Um, yeah, well, I would, I would count that. I would say I think Patrick Stewart in a vacuum, in especially like a dramatic role, I think Stewart's the best actor. But I think for this show, Spiner is better suited to it, so he is the best actor in this environment. I like if you put if you put Spiner. I'm trying to think of a really dramatic role that I've seen Stewart in, but I can't. I mean, like Macbeth or something would be like the things. Yeah, like if you put them in something like Macbeth, where you're, if you're a good dramatic actor that is playing to your strengths, I think that Picard, that Stewart is. uh, Yeah, I guess actor. I don't have. I don't think Spiner would do as well there. However, in this thing, playing an android, I think Spiner is particularly perfectly suited to playing data and i think just kind of in the in the environment of the tv show uh spiner is better because picard is because he's a dramatic actor almost everything he does is dramatic and i finally got in my fiance watching some tng with me and every other line that picard says she's like oh my gosh he's so dramatic yeah and looking back i'm like he is. He he is. I I don't think I noticed it before, but he every single line has so much weight to it. It's sometimes it can be a little over the top. So I would agree for at least TNG. Picard might be outside of TNG, outside of this particular environment. I think that Picard, uh, Patrick Stewart, 
would be better, but I would agree that within the show, Spiner, I, I think is playing to all his strengths as Data. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I'd relate it to who do you think the better baseball player would be? You have the power hitter who is just, you know, pure power, or you have like a five tool player. And I think mm-hmm. Spiner's the five tool actor. Like he that can, makes sense. he can play the different roles more effectively. Patrick Stewart, I don't even think when he's pretending to be Mott in this episode, it's that good. Like he, he's not. It's not great. I, I, I don't know. He's he, Patrick Stewart, you know, watching a lot of this, I feel he's a little bit limited in his range about what he can do. He's very good at what he's very good at, mm-hmm. but he can't oh, yeah. he can't play different roles differently, which Spiner is very good at. He, he He's a different character for each person that he plays. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I going on that alone, it, just the versatility of him. But anyway, I mean, it, it ties into the fact that Spiner gets to ham it up when he gets the chance. And then... Yeah. We have these scenes with Hutch. Uh, which... I liked Hutchinson, and I did not get why every single character acted like he was the worst person to be around. He sounded <laughs> like fun. He sounded like a genuine guy. Maybe he's a little bit. Maybe he'd be a little annoying to be around in person, but he just seems like a genuinely friendly guy. And they just actively try to avoid him. Yep. And then he gets killed. And nobody mentions him again because fuck him. He was no, annoying, no, right? No, no, no one. Can. <laughs> that is the. If, I think it feels like the covered. show is glad he's dead. <laughs> yes, I. Uh, I mean, I can, I can understand, and yeah, the not wanting. I, I certainly don't think His the death show was really upsetting to, to me. <laughs> it's bizarre that he's he's just brutally murdered. It shows the <laughs> the the strength of Jordy, where he can just take one in the chest and uh, yeah, of course, yeah. Coming. Jordy gets shot. He's fine. Hutchinson gets died. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah, he's he's done. I, I like that I like that beat. I mean, it goes on for way too long. It's like 15 minutes of storyline that's unnecessary. Yeah, they could, they could have cut it down. Um, but um, I think it's a good idea. It's interesting to see them interact with people outside the ship. I was thinking it's kind of funny that the only conversations I hear the crew members ever have is kind of small talk. <laughs> so it was funny to me <coughs> that they hate small talk. So because it's, you know, they, they obviously have in-depth conversations occasionally. But I can't imagine the yeah. crew of the Enterprise having really, really personal conversations with each other. Yeah, um, Yeah, and then also Picard, when Data talks about small talk, Picard says, oh, small talk, as if it's some alien concept. It's They're beyond it. Weird. In the 21st century, uh, no, yeah. no one does small talk at that point. <laughs> My other thing about Data in the, in the reception area is I, I, I don't know why Data doesn't, doesn't just leap across the room in a blink of an eye and implode the bad guy's heads. Because he's inhumanly powerful and inhumanly fast, yet he's always easily incapacitated, just like everyone else. They were, they were. The, the, you never see his <laughs> speed when trying to decide. Maybe not even. I know he's in a program to kill, but take away their weapons. He's like been rascals. Uh, he barely stands up, and of course the Ferengi has the gun pointed in his chest. Nope, nope. I can't possibly outspeed a Ferengi. They're they're on top of us. Well, when they showed his uh, super, never... super speed in season one, it was horrible. So I don't think they ever want to do oh that again. Gosh. Yeah, I, <laughs> that I mining so. episode. I just want to see him. He's an he's an android. I want to see him kick ass. Well, he has that one. But he never does. He has the one pointless scene with. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. That's a different episode. Yeah, this one he he definitely is not involved whatsoever in it. I can't. Yeah, he shoots some. He shoots up some stuff once in an episode in season three. But you never, and I suppose it's just a limitation of the show and the budget, but I never, if this is a modern, any kind of modern sci-fi, I feel like every time someone would try to take the group hostage, you'd see Data just blitzkrieging them so fast. It's it's just a blur, right. and I'm just disappointed that I never get to see it in this. <laughs> it would uh, fix too many problems, I suppose. The... I think that's pretty much it. I don't really have much else to say about this episode. Did you, I, did you have anything? Mm, no, final, not really. Final thoughts. Sounds like it's final thoughts. So we're going to come nope. back after this audio Oh, wait. Clip. I, I do have another. There is one kind of show-breaking thing for me. Uh, I, I've just learned that saddles are typically made for the horse and not the rider's butt. So why Picard would have his own saddle? Mm, that That's... That's too big of a logical flaw for me for this episode. Uh, one out of one out of five. <laughs> one out of five. I don't. Um, I don't understand the saddle bit uh, because they play it in the beginning when he says he's got to go back and sat- get a saddle. They're playing it like he's lying about it. 
And I don't understand why. Well, that's because the most bizarre thing ever, which, again, I, I don't... You have a replicator, so you can make anything you want. You, they could make a saddle on the ship. Like, there's no reason to yeah. have to go back to the ship. I mean, they do it to get him back there, but there's no plot reason why that would need to happen. They play it as if he is lying to them about it. Yeah. And then the ending scene where everyone has... Everyone's kind of making this joke about the saddle, and I don't understand. They're like, oh, any real totally rider would have a saddle. It's like, what? what's the joke here? Is, is, is this mean anything? I don't think they, in the 24th century, nobody goes outside, so. Yeah, maybe they're just, just kind of a weirdo. I mean, worf has got all this Klingon shit all over the place, so why, why do they care about his saddle? It's, it's very Smart odd. move by Picard, by the way. Where are there lots of weapons on the Enterprise? Worf's course. yeah, he's got a crossbow. <laughs> just, of course he would. <laughs> All right, let's go to final thoughts. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back and give our final thoughts and ratings for Starship Mine. Kelsey to Kiros. Is this Kiros? We have a problem. There's a Starfleet officer still aboard. He's killed Sattler and he may have killed Devor. He also destroyed the diverter and engineering. So we have to leave here before the Baryon sweep enters this section. What about the Trilithium resin? We're taking it with us to 10 forward. There should be enough time before... Kelsey, don't be a fool. You know better than to try to move trilithium resin. Mr. Mott, or should I call you Lieutenant? Lieutenant Commander, perhaps? You can call me whatever you wish. But moving trilithium resin requires very specific equipment. You can't just improvise something. I wouldn't need to improvise if you hadn't damaged our field diverter. But if you're so concerned about the trilithium, I suggest you stop interfering with us before you set off an explosion that would destroy the Enterprise and you. Let's go. Final thoughts and ratings for Starship Mine. You want to go first? I'll go first. Um, I will admit you pointed out some flaws to me that makes me slightly reconsider my rating, but I think I think I'm going to stick with it. I would say a four, a four out of five. I was thinking maybe a strong four out of five initially. Maybe I'm vacillating towards a weak four out of five, but I, I think I, I did. I know that there's flaws, but I can enjoy it enough that it's not distracting for me. And perhaps, and I only watched these episodes once to review them. Perhaps watching it two or th- three more times, I'd be clawing my eyeballs out by that point. Uh, but it's not—it's an episode that I never skip. And I feel, if we're talking about what you do to introduce start, what you'd show a non-trekkie, I'd probably show my fiance this just because it has a bit of action. And it has, and it's it's a fun episode. It's not certainly not Star Trek at its best, and I'm sure that there's plenty of other four out of fives that are better. Uh, I know there's plenty of four out of fives that are better, but I feel like I enjoyed it more than a three out of five would warrant. Sure, it's um to me it's a fine episode that has a lot of problems that shine through once you start to think about it. Um, and if you're going for this kind of action sequence where it's based on the, the diehard ideal and everything, the script has to be tighter than what this one is. Um, I'm going to give it a three out of five. I think it's fairly average, except it's a watchable, like average episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any problem like watching it. I think if you shut off your brain to what the problems are, I think it's very enjoyable and I think it's, it's fine. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's paced a little bit oddly. It's not... It's not really interestingly about anything. Not that it needs to be about like a big idea, but it needs to have yeah. some kind. The plot needs to be stronger than what they're currently giving us for these guys, for the terrorists, for this weapon, for Picard's reason to be on the ship, for the reason to be avoiding it, the reason to be on the on the planet. Like I need more than what they're giving me. Uh, I'm gonna give it a three out of five, and that's about it. It's, that's a, fair. it's a strong three. It's just yeah. not. It's not. Uh, it's not garbage. Not garbage. Think- it's definitely not garbage. I think, honestly, I think a lot of people seem to think that an average rating, like a 3 out of 5 or a 5 out of 10, it indicates that it's a bad episode. But that doesn't mean it's a bad episode. It just means it's an average. There's nothing... Most TV shows are average, so most of their episodes will be average. Yep. Saying it's 3 out of 5 is not saying that it's complete. It, it's it's not a dumpster fire. Well, I think it's the, it's the dumbing down of... Mm-hmm. grading right like like at yeah. a certain point where if you get a b and it's not good enough you're like you know a, a b Failure. is a b is fine a b is above average yeah. by its definition so on, on the american yeah. grading scale so i mean you know if if everyone gets a's it doesn't mean anything if uh everyone gets c's it doesn't mean anything you need to grade on the curve but yeah I, I i think it's it's fine there's nothing wrong with this episode i think it sound it's um 
it's just not as good. It's not as good as I remembered, which is the key factor to it, I think, mm-hmm. in my grade here. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed the content, you're on YouTube. Like in the comments. Appreciate it. On iTunes, rating and review helps get the show out there. We're on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Podcast. And you can get exclusive content. We have a couple uh, like tiers that we're trying to get to to get more exclusive content on the Patreon. Uh, we have the Facebook.com slash the Penske Podcast. You can go there for whatever reason. We have all this stuff. You can go to all the places that have the Penske Podcast. And the website being none the least, uh, you can go to the Penske Podcast.com, get all the episodes. Because I'm sure iTunes, if you're using iTunes, is shutting down now because we're getting past 100 episodes. So, Christian, thank you very oh, really? much for coming on. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, oh, yeah, plug you, uh, the subreddit, yeah. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, I run uh, the subreddit Star Trek Viewing Party. You can find that on Reddit, uh, slash r slash Star Trek Viewing Party. Our goal is just to rewatch through all of Star Trek. We're finishing up Season 7 of TNG right now. We actually have an event that's going to be starting on July 20th for the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. We're calling it 50 Days of Trek bunch of kind of special more general discussion topics uh like pitch your pitch a star trek series pitch a fix to your worst episode pitch a fix to your least liked character stuff like that it should be fun and then on august 7th we will be starting ds9 um there's going to be a very big revamp of the uh subreddit theme to go along with DS9, and I've been working on this for months, and it looks amazing. So <laughs> check it out. It'll be good to see. And, uh, yeah, guys, check it out. It's good. There's a solid group of people who uh, continually post on every single post, every single episode. Some discussions go places, um, and a lot of it's just people sort of feedback about what they thought about the episodes, and sometimes it's interesting when people disagree. I, I'm always intrigued by the ones that I always disagree with people about. I like the I, I agree. I like the ones where there's some uh, dissension, because... If everyone agrees, just you just kind of it's an echo chamber. I right, like it when right. there's some. And yeah. honestly, I feel like it's a good community because I don't. There's not a bunch of fluff or spam. I feel like every most posts are substantial of, of good quality. Yep. And yeah, I mean, I'm at this point, I'd be more interested in the person who hates like yesterday's Enterprise. I, like, I want to hear yeah. that person's opinion because. <laughs> well, no, ex- except for that one. Anyone who doesn't like yesterday's Enterprise is just. It's garbage. just wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I'm looking for uh, for that kind of thing, especially after doing so many episodes. Anyway, guys, go to Star Trek uh, viewing party on the Reddit's, and uh, otherwise check out all the Penske podcast stuff. Go to Patreon. Blah 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 blah. Thank you guys very much for listening. I appreciate it greatly, and we'll be back with uh, lessons. I think it's me and Amy are doing that one if my schedule holds up. But otherwise, I will see you next time.